A farewell fit for a hero. Funeral services for Trevor Brown wrapped up today. The local volunteer firefighter was killed in the line of duty about two weeks ago. We'll show you the outpouring of the support for his family after a devastating house explosion. Plus, combating D.C.'s crime crisis this week, the city council will take its final vote on a sweeping crime bill. Why there's still controversy swirling around the legislation. Then several fraternities and sororities at the University of Maryland are forbidden from contacting new members indefinitely. Hear from students who feel left in the dark about why. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And we thank you for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Jim Adley, and it's Monday, March 4th. We begin tonight in Loudoun County, where a community came together today to say goodbye to a fallen hero. Civilians, dignitaries, and a sea of first responders from far and wide joined to pay their respects to volunteer firefighter Trevor Brown. Even the giant Cornerstone Chapel Church couldn't hold the crowd that gathered today. A testament to Brown's brave actions as he gave his life trying to protect others during last month's house explosion in Sterling. News 4's Drew Wilder has the poignant moments from this emotional ceremony. A brotherhood of heartbroken, at attention, in salute, in honor of one of their own killed in the line of duty. Thousands gathered to celebrate the life of volunteer firefighter Trevor Brown and to wrap their arms around his three children and his wife, Laura. Laura, if there's ever a doubt as to why there are 3,000 people here today, why community members bake cakes, why children write cards, why large, strong men openly weep, it's because Trevor's one of us, and we are Trevor. Firefighter Brown was killed last month when he and several others responded to a report of a gas leak at a Sterling home. That home exploded, and his children lost their father, a wife, her husband, a father, his son. As his father, I so loved our strong hello and goodbye hugs and talks. Trevor Brian Brown is our absolute hero who selflessly supported and protected us with great goodness. A massive sanctuary wasn't enough. Others watched from overflow rooms or even outside. Thousands of first responders from across the country, the ones who show up in our moments of crisis, doing the same for one of their own. Requiring a love that is so immense that you will willingly lay down your life selflessly for others. Trevor had this rare heart and soul. The flag over his casket then folded. The family who gave this county their husband and father is given symbols of his service as his final service call goes out over the radio waves. Loud and calling Trevor 611, firefighter Trevor Brown. Having heard no response from firefighter Trevor Brown, we know that firefighter Brown has responded to his last call on earth and that the fire service in the hereafter has a new firefighter. The hereafter gained more than a selfless hero. It gained a man devoted to his family, whose memory lives on within them. As Trevor Brown is laid to rest, the recovery continues for some of his colleagues. One of the firefighters who was injured in that house explosion is still recovering in a burn unit in a D.C. hospital tonight. Reporting in Loudoun County, Drew Wilder, News 4. While the new year has seen a slight decrease in some crimes in the district, the mayor and council members are eager to pass new crime-fighting legislation. Tomorrow, the council will take its final vote on a sweeping crime bill. But as News 4's Mark Seagraves reports, there is still controversy swirling around the measure. Crimes like carjacking, gun violence, and retail theft are all addressed in the crime bill the D.C. Council will take a final vote on tomorrow. Councilmember Brooke Pinto, who chairs the Judiciary Committee, will try to get one provision that was in the original bill, but voted out by the council last month, back into the final bill, giving police the authority to collect DNA samples from suspects before they are convicted. This is a common sense intervention that will help us close cases, it will help drive down recidivism, it will support victims. It is really outrageous to me that it was taken out in the first place. Nine of the 13 council members voted to remove the DNA collection from the bill. Pinto has made some changes to the original proposal. She hopes will sway enough of her colleagues to get the DNA provision back into the legislation. 
Originally, Pinto wanted to give police authority to collect DNA at the time of arrest. Now she stepped that back. We should collect and analyze DNA after charging has been made and after a judge has determined that there's probable cause to bring a case um, and for a slightly narrower category of cases. So these will be our violent felonies and crimes of violence and our sexual assault misdemeanors. Other provisions of the legislation expected to face some opposition include giving police power to designate drug-free zones in high crime areas. If there's an effort to strike the drug-free zones, from the bill, I don't think that will be successful. The bill in its current form would also increase penalties for some gun crimes, make it easier for judges to detain adults and juveniles charged with violent crimes while they await trial. It refines circumstances when police are allowed to engage in a car chase. It would expand the definition of carjacking and expand retail theft charges. In the district, Mark Seagraves, News 4. Now the U.S. Attorney for the District and Mayor Bowser support putting the DNA collection back into the bill. The American Civil Liberties Union of D.C. and other groups have opposed it. The chairman of the D.C. Council is warning district residents now and business owners too that they could be in for a tax increase soon. We've been telling you about the impact of federal workers and others working from home on the D.C. economy. Now that and other pressures like the loss of federal pandemic relief funds have the district facing budget shortfalls in the next few years. D.C. Council Chair Phil Mendelson told reporters cuts to some programs and some type of tax increase are more likely than not. I, I believe that there's going to be a, a tax increase, uh, but um, beyond that, I can't speculate what it would be. Last week, when News 4 asked Mayor Bowser about the possibility of a tax increase, the mayor would not rule it out. The future of artificial intelligence may be just right here in the D.C. area. A commercial real estate survey found the D.C. metro area has now surpassed San Francisco for AI-related job posts. More than 1,000 openings were listed in December. A big reason for that glut of jobs, the federal government. While many Silicon Valley tech companies are cutting jobs, federal opportunities in health care, tech, defense and finance are on the rise. About half the AI openings are around here require a government clearance. The other big reason AI is calling this area home, all those data centers in Northern Virginia, which is the largest data center market in the world. Bloomberg says the AI market will be worth more than $1 trillion in the next 10 years. The University of Maryland ordered 21 fraternities and 16 sororities on campus to suspend social and recruiting events amid hazing concerns. The social moratorium is now in place prohibiting chapters from hosting any social events with alcohol on or off campus. News Force Megan McGrath has more from UMD, where a lot of students say they're still unclear about the reason for the crackdown. Well, it was a quiet weekend for many of the fraternities and sororities on the campus of the University of Maryland. A cease and desist order remains in effect, meaning no events on or off campus that serve alcohol. The suspension of new member, new member programs also continues. That means that current fraternity and sorority members are not allowed contact of any kind with new or prospective members. Now, the restrictions apply to 21 fraternities and the Interfraternity Council and 16 sororities and the Pan-Hellenic Council. A letter sent out by the university says there were reports of activities that threatened the safety and well-being of others, but the letter provided no other details. Now, it's a big topic of conversation on campus. There are a lot of rumors swirling around, but students we spoke to say they don't know the specifics of what happened to prompt the crackdown. But all we know is that as of now, everyone's on cease and desist. We don't really have a reason or an end date or anything. They're just going through investigations is what we've been told. So we don't really know when we'll be back to normal or if it ever will go back. I mean, of course, there's been a lot of talk about it, but in terms of specifics, no one really knows. So I've been, you know, hearing whispers here and there, but in terms of my personal like conversations that I've had, no one really knows about what's really going on. 
Now, the restrictions do not apply to the university's traditionally black Greek letter organizations or chapters that are part of the Multicultural Greek Council. Now, there is an investigation underway. The restrictions, we're told, will remain in effect until that investigation is wrapped up, but we don't know how long it will take. In College Park, Megan McGrath, News 4. Tonight, an urgent warning for families on a deadly social media trend. Two local teens have died in the past year while subway surfing on metro trains. That's where someone tries to ride on top of or outside of the train. A teenage girl died Friday in Silver Spring and a teen boy died last June near Rhode Island Avenue in D.C. News Force Amy Cho spoke with that boy's grieving parents who say they're sharing their story to help protect other children. He was the center of our lives, and it was like the center of our lives just fell out. 15-year-old Jay Thiruna Ryan Apuram from Silver Spring was smart, outgoing, and talented at art. But his parents say he also loved adrenaline, and he would do things like subway surfing to try to impress his friends on social media. He said, I've, I've heard of other kids dying too, I know. Yeah. But I know it's not going to happen to me. So he was overconfident. That was actually his undoing in the end. Last June, Jay's parents say he was trying to go subway surfing on a red line metro train near Rhode Island Avenue when he was killed. This past Friday, another teen girl died the same way in Silver Spring. It's horrible to live with pain like this and, you know, to know what our child went through in those last moments. They've been asking Metro to install sensors and cameras on top of trains and say they're frustrated the agency has yet to do so. We need to be proactive and Metro is a member of this community. It needs to step up and it needs to make sure that no train leaves the platform with somebody riding outside a train. Metro sent News 4 a statement saying riding outside of a train car is dangerous, illegal and highly likely to result in serious injury or death. The agency says there are signs throughout the trains reminding people not to walk between cars. News 4 asked Metro if it plans to enact any new safety measures, but the agency didn't say. Jay's parents tell News 4 they plan to keep sharing their story in hopes of protecting others. We want to make sure that no, no parent has to go through this again and no child has to die in this horrible way. Amy Cho, News 4. Mm. So sad. Now, Metro told us subway surfers can be charged with trespassing or disorderly conduct. There were more than 450 subway surfing incidents in New York City last year. Five people there died. TikTok previously announced it will remove content from its site that's related to subway surfing. Another layer of safety is coming to Metro, and you may have already noticed the transit agency is trying to beef up special police patrols across the system. Our transportation reporter Adam Tuss has our story. Yeah, you know, it's one of the things we hear from Metro riders all the time. They want to feel safe and secure on the transit system. Well, now you're going to start to see more special police walking through trains and buses. Metro has made a concerted effort to really increase its police presence. They've cut deals with local police departments. Uh, they've been hiring these special police officers, and you're going to see them walking through trains and buses wearing these security vests uh, and special police badges to try to cut down on crime in real time. Uh, since last year, Metro has increased its partnerships with local police by 70%. So certainly an increase here as they're trying to cut down on crime. And riders tell us, you know, crime is something they really don't even want to think about. As, as good as the metro can be, you want to see it working as efficiently as possible. They don't want to worry about potential issues or anything like that. So. You know, Metro is one of the most wired transit systems in the world. 30,000 cameras in stations, on trains and buses. And they say so far crime has gone down 14% since this time last year. We'll see how it works out. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Adam. Amtrak announcing today that they have increased service to better serve the Northeast region. The additional travel options now include four new weekday round trips and two weekend round trips between Washington and New York City. Amtrak says these locally added trip options and new trips offered in Pennsylvania and Boston will increase their capacity by a million seats in the Northeast. The addition is part of Amtrak's plan to increase ridership to 66 million by 2040. Amtrak says you can start buying tickets for the added services now. 
Three passengers are suing Boeing and Alaska Airlines for one billion dollars. The lawsuit is for damages in the wake of that door panel blowing out midair on their flight. The suit also seeks damages on behalf of other passengers who may have flown on Boeing 737 MAX 9 aircrafts. It's not, however, linked to another class action lawsuit filed back in January in the immediate wake. Now, both the FAA and NTSB continue to investigate that January blowout incident. Boeing declined to comment. Alaska said it does not comment on pending litigation or the ongoing NTSB investigation. The first non-prescription birth control pill could be heading to a store and store shelves across the country in the end of this month. O-Pill was approved by the FDA for over-the-counter sales back in July. A one-month supply will cost 20 bucks. There is also a three-month supply option for $50 and a six-month option for $90. The pill's rollout comes amid legal battles over women's reproductive rights following the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court in 2022. The drug maker says the medication should be available late this month or early April. When we come back, deductions not to overlook when you're doing your taxes this year. From home improvements to tuition payments, we run down what you need to know. Still ahead in the scene, DC's Woolly Mammoth Theater has a whole week of programming around Native American art, performance, and their craftsmanship. Plus, we're gonna get a very special lesson from Miss Chief Raka coming up on News 4. Today in the scene, Tommy McFly joins us with an exciting dance demo and a way you can get immersed in Native American culture this week in DC. Hey, Tommy. A celebration of Native American performance and goods at DC's Woolly Mammoth Theater this week. Miss Chief Rocca joins us along with Kristen Jackson from Woolly. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having us. So on Tuesday, you've got the performance, 7.30, a very special celebrating Native performance. What do you have planned for the audience? Dance from Miss Chief Rocca. We're going to have some singing from the Zotai singers. What is a hoop dance if someone's never heard it before? It is a traditional ceremonial and healing dance. It's also a storytelling dance that comes from the Taos Pueblo tribe of New Mexico and spread throughout Turtle Island to different nations. And I'm Cree, so you're gonna see some Cree style today. The Native Arts Market as well on Saturday, 10 a.m. What kind of wares or artisans and craft people are gonna be doing there? We're gonna have yeah. bead workers, jewelry makers, and just a bunch of fabulous pieces for folks to pick up. And I actually brought some hoops to share with oh, you today. Oh, okay. Let's see if you could do a few moves. This is a universal step. It's a little one-two step we do at powwows. So during intertribals, when everyone is welcome to dance, you're welcome to come in there. <laughs> Thank you. And do the step. You're gonna step through both of them. You're gonna drop the inside hoop. Yes, and then you're gonna take your other hoop and put it on top. You're gonna stack it in front of the other so that, yeah. Yeah. Woo, there it is. Awesome, next move, you're going to grab the hoop at the bottom, step out, and you're gonna do the most traditional one of all, the Mickey Mouse. The no. Mickey Mouse <laughs> <laughs> it could be a bull. And then we're gonna bring the two hoops on top together and put it, put your head through the middle and take this hoop, you're gonna put over top and put your arms through it. You're gonna reach over and grab your two hoops down below. You're gonna go through and pull. Oh, bam. It works! Look at that! And then spin. <laughs> yeah. So this was like an eagle? Or yes, what is the this? eagle, yes. This is bam. so fun. Bam. You can follow Miss Chief Rocca online. Your videos are fantastic. Oh, thank thank you. you for being here. Thank you for joining us. This is wild. This is what a great lesson today, and thank you for your performance. Back to you. Fun stuff. Tommy, thank you. And if you're looking to rent in our area, you might be better off living in the district than in Arlington County, Virginia. New numbers from apartment rental website Zumper.
found on average it costs more to rent in Arlington than in D.C. The website looked at the cost of renting a one bedroom and found in Arlington it's about $2,300, whereas in D.C. a one bedroom will cost you about $2,200 a month. Arlington ranks seventh, by the way, on Zumper's list of cities with the most expensive rents. The district ranks ninth, tied with Los Angeles. Well, whether you love it or hate it, tax season is upon us. We're working for you all week long, helping you get the right advice and tips to get the most out of your tax returns. Tax deductions and credits can be the key to a big tax refund, but knowing what applies to you can sometimes be confusing. Our consumer reporter Susan Hogan breaks down some popular tax benefits you should ask your tax professional about. If you're a student or have student loans, there are a couple of tax credits and deductions that might apply to you. Let's start with the student loan interest deduction. This allows borrowers to write off up to $2,500 from their taxable income if they paid interest on their student loans. There's also the American Opportunity Tax Credit. This lets you claim all of the first $2,000 you spent on tuition, books, equipment, and school fees. If you're a parent, the child tax credit is for families with children under 17 years old that meet income requirements. The credit gives you up to $2,000 per child with $1,600 of it being potentially refundable. But that amount can go up to $800 in your 2023 taxes if the Senate approves the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. And if you have child care expenses, the Child and Dependent Care Credit covers a percentage of daycare for children under 13. It can also be applied to a spouse, a parent, or dependent that is unable to take care of themselves. And if you made upgrades to your home this year, like energy efficient windows, doors, heat pumps, ask your tax professional about the energy efficient home improvement tax credit. It can put up to $3,200 back into your pocket. Back to you guys. Thank you, Susan. Still ahead on the rundown, a donation that's sure to make a big difference in a sick child's life. If you have long hair, there's something you can do to help. News 4's Megan McGrath explains after the break. Grappling with a serious medical condition can be very difficult for children, making things worse, hair loss that can sometimes come with diagnosis and treatment. If you have long hair, there's something you can do to help. The Great Cut is a mass hair donation event taking place this month. The hair will be used to make wigs for kids with medical hair loss. News 4's Megan McGrath caught up with a local woman who recently cut off her locks for the cause. Okay. Erica Hoskins' hair is down to her waist. It took years to grow, but the Fairfax County teacher is cutting it off for a good cause. There we go. Hoskin is participating in the Great oh Cut, a mass hair donation event benefiting the group Children with Hair Loss. I love that it's going to help somebody, that it can make somebody feel better and special is amazing. Yeah. Hoskins' donated locks will be turned into a wig and given to a child who lost their hair due to a medical condition. Someone like Bella Clopton. I would wake up every morning and there would just be clumps of hair like everywhere. People mocking and making fun of me. And also like just like pointing and staring. It was honestly a really hard feeling to get past. Thanks to the group Children with Hair Loss, Bella was given a wig free of charge. It's stories like hers that inspired Lindsay Bartow and Chris Healy to come up with a great cut, an event that collects hundreds of pounds of hair for children's wigs. I am going to buzz my hair entirely. We've got every bit of 26 inches here. The in-person group cut is in San Diego on March 16th, but people around the country can cut their hair and mail it in, just like Erica Hoskin did. Bringing together thousands of like-minded people willing to give up something for a cause greater than themselves. Bartow and Healy are the guys behind the Long Hairs, a men's grooming company. They already hold the Guinness Book World Record for the largest hair donation, and they hope to break that record this year. So this is what I'm going to do. DC stylist Peggy Iokim cut Hoskins locks. She often styles the hair of visiting celebrities. I feel like She's the celebrity here. <laughs> She's doing amazing things for 
special children. So this is going to even everything out. And if you want to donate your hair, it needs to arrive in the mail by March 16th. You can go to the Long Hair's website for details. Megan McGrath, News 4. That's so wonderful. What a difference they're making. Heads up, Nats fans. Today, the team is launching a new ticket offer exclusively for D.C. residents. How'd you like to go to a game for just five bucks? That's the price the new district tickets allows. There will be 400 district ticket seats available for every home game this season. You have to buy them in person at the center field gate box office at Nats Park. Starting today, the box office will open every weekday in March from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. You have to show proof of D.C. residency and you're limited to four games and four tickets per game. You cannot transfer the tickets or resell them. You can also buy district tickets on game days while they last. Go get them. That's going to do it for us on the News 4 Rundown. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jim Antley. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.